Yeah, thank you very much. So the past I'm going to talk about is your own past, which sometimes is thought to be a normal past. And I'm going to start by showing a, a big picture because the theme of this is the big picture. And the big picture I want to show is a picture of big cloud. Uh, cloud somewhere in West Texas, uh, thunderstorm, people who live in Texas know you expect strong winds, heavy rain, lightning, potentially hail, uh, maybe even a tornado. Um, but if you've been here long enough, you're not really going to be especially frightened by uh, a cloud that looks like this. Uh, except I grew up in California, and the type of cloud that I was accustomed to uh, looks completely different from that. It's a, we call it low stratus. It's clouds that form over the cold water of the Pacific Ocean and they move inland during the nighttime and, and morning hours and then burn off in the afternoon. Uh, if you're waiting for a thunderstorm to burn off, you're gonna be quite disappointed. So it was interesting to come to Texas and see a completely different cloudscape because it's not really what I thought clouds looked like. Um, we got to thunderstorm about once every couple of years and if we're lucky we, we heard thunder and maybe we even saw a flash of lightning but that was about it. Even in Texas though I uh, didn't see the full suite of clouds. This sort of cloud called a lenticular cloud is common in the lee of the Rocky Mountains. This particular photo taken near Denver. Folks who live there are quite accustomed to these clouds that look like spaceships whereas they would look completely alien to most flatlanders and those of us who live in the mid latitudes would generally not be accustomed to seeing clouds that have this sort of appearance which is in fact common north of the arctic circle so our experience of weather and our experience of clouds is based upon our own perception of what's normal um, clouds that look unusual to us are, are quite common to people in different locations and our experience of normal also affects our emotional reaction to uh, any new experiences we see. So for example, imagine that you land at an airport in a foreign country, and you have to get to your place you're staying somewhere in the city, so you walk outside and say, okay, well, how do we get there? What's the, what's the normal form of transportation? And depending on what you find, you might feel, okay, this is cool, or what am I doing here? Um, so, for example, you might encounter a jitney, which is a common form of transportation in many countries, and you might be kind of scared about how to approach this. Um, if you have a friend meeting you at the airport and he tells you, yeah, this is, this is how we do it, no problem, get on, you'll feel a lot more comfortable because you know that somebody else thinks that this is something perfectly normal. Uh, but that's not normal in all other places. Uh, perhaps a motorcycle taxi will be the common mode. Seems a little odd, but it may be see the familiar color on the fenders and think, okay, this is a cab. I can, I can get used to this. Um, perhaps uh, you'd be uh, frightened if you were asked to get into an unmarked black car. Uh, but black car limousines are a thing that are a common means of transportation in major cities uh, for people who feel um, that uh, taxi cabs are a little too grungy. Now what about something like train travel? Surely trains are sort of a universal form of travel. They exist in, in poor countries, they exist in rich countries. Uh, everybody can travel on a train, right? Um, sometimes they can all travel on the same train. And this might indeed make you uncomfortable because you'd see, oh gee, there's people, uh, blocking the view of the engineer. What if the driver can't see? What's gonna happen if the engineer can't see? Well, what if there's no driver? What if in 20 years, everybody's getting around through automated autonomous vehicles and, and there's nobody sitting in the driver's seat that actually has to touch the steering wheel? Uh, that could be scary. Uh, maybe, maybe you'd just be willing to throw up your hands and just uh, give up entirely, or perhaps you just go ahead and accept whatever form of transportation you could find uh, recognizing the possibility that uh, whatever it is probably is going to work and you just go ahead and take your chances. Uh, 
Uh, it's not just our emotional experience that is affected by what we consider to be normal. Um, our relationship with other people is affected by what we consider to be normal ways a person acts, normal sets of values, normal sets of experiences. So uh, consider, for example, a group of children. Uh, suppose I told you that two of these children were having a normal childhood and in fact that it was those two children. Are you looking at this picture in a different way? Are you finding it be, you would expect to be able to relate better to the kids having a normal childhood uh, versus the kids that are not? Probably uh, when you were growing up, at first you thought that your childhood was normal because your experience was pretty much limited to your family. Then as you um, got older, you encountered other kids who were having other experiences and possibly that reinforced your perception that you're having other experiences and possibly that reinforced your perception that your childhood was a fairly normal one or perhaps you recognize yours was unusual compared to others. Uh, well, you know, even if it's normal in some sense, there's still gonna be a sense in which it's not normal. Uh, for example, all of these kids are growing up in Nepal. And if you're growing up in the United States or in the Philippines or in um, Morocco, your experience of what a normal childhood is is gonna be quite different. So um, frankly, uh, every childhood is different. Every person's experience is different. And we probably shouldn't think of any individual experience as being a normal experience. Instead, we should think of it as a precious experience, one that is unique to each of us, one that has aspects that are in common with other people's experiences, uh, but one that is nonetheless quite unique to us and affects our relationship with the, with the rest of the world, with the rest of the people in the world and, and how we uh, deal with them. And we should perhaps recognize everybody else is having a very precious experience that's unique to them and is, uh, uh, gives them their own unique perspective that they can share with us that we can't quite uh, understand because we have a different experience than what they've had. Okay, let's get to climate and climate change. Uh, we all have different experiences of climate um, due to where we grew up in part. Um, climate in West Texas, if you grew up in West Texas, you have an experience of climate that is different from the experience that you would have in Central Texas. And that's different from the experience you'd have in Eastern Texas as well. And um, now, to be honest, most of us don't experience climate like that. We, we experience growing up in a city where the climate has been modified, where those sets of plants that I showed you that were acclimated to particular climates uh, aren't really found in the cities. Instead, people bring their own plants, uh, put them in the garden, and water them to change the climate so that they can be healthy. Um, that was an intentional modification of the climate. Cities themselves unintentionally have modified the climate by creating things like the urban heat island. And then we are modifying the climate globally, um, initially completely inadvertently, but now with knowledge of what we're doing uh, because of adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Temperatures have gone up by about a degree Celsius over the past century. Uh, you've probably seen uh, charts like this before, for example. If you look at projections of future climate, whether you consider uh, projections from a climate uh, consensus like the IPCC or uh, climate uh, skeptics, it's really a different, uh, well, similar sort of picture. Now, to put this into perspective, I want to consider how the climate has changed over a long period of time. So let's take a look at the past 11,000 years of the Earth's climate as it's been estimated. And 
uh, it varied by a few degrees. Each one of these tick marks is one degree Celsius. But it's been a fairly regular envelope for the past 7,000 years. Now we're up near the top of the envelope. If you take those projections that I spoke about, we're going to be outside of that envelope within the next couple of decades, no matter which set of projections you look at. So those plants and animals that have been accustomed to their own unique ecosystems in different parts of Texas have the choice. Well, they don't have a choice. They can either move with the climate if they can move fast enough, given how fast it's changing, or they can um, adapt and evolve to the climate that's changing to try to recover some ability to deal with the sort of climate uh, that would used to be normal to them or perhaps is becoming normal to them. Uh, in Texas, the climate's changing a lot. Um, temperatures have gone up fairly steadily over the past few decades, about a half to three quarters of a degree per decade. Uh, rainfall has increased across uh, much of the state. It's gone down in a few uh, parts of West Texas. Uh, but the thing I really want to focus on is extreme rainfall. Uh, we refer to things like a 100-year rainfall event as the amount of rain that you expect to occur in a given location about once every 100 years on average. So very rare. It's not every 100 years. You might have two in consecutive years and then have nothing for 300 years. But on average, once every 100 years. And hydrologists take that rainfall estimate and figure out how much water that would produce running across the landscape. And that's how they define a 100-year floodplain, the area that would be expected to flood at least on average once every 100 years. Now, with climate change, because the atmosphere is getting warmer, uh, the atmosphere can hold more water. And so it can produce more rainfall in those really torrential events. And because of that, uh, the value of the 100-year rainfall is going up. And because of that, the size of floodplains are increasing also. So imagine you live in this house. Um, it wasn't in the floodplain when you bought it, but because heavy rainfall is becoming more intense, it's been reassessed and it's now within a floodplain. That means you got to buy flood insurance. Uh, it's going to cost you more to live in that house. Maybe you can't afford to stay there. Maybe you have to sell the house. Well, gee, your, the value of your house has gone down because now it's more expensive to live there. Who else is going to want to buy the thing? So this can be a catastrophic impact of climate change without any extreme event actually happening. And your ability to deal with that sort of event is probably quite a bit different depending on whether you're living in that sort of house or living in this sort of house. Well, the experience that we have of climate change actually varies from place to place. In Harris County, where Houston is, they've had lots of extreme rainfall events recently. So if we take a look at the wettest day of every single year for a particular station in Harris County across the past century or plus, um, your typical wettest day of the year was about three inches back in 1900. It's over four inches now. And the estimate of the one in a hundred rainfall chance was eight inches. It's now 12 inches based just on that historical record at just one station. Now you wouldn't want to base your future plans on just a single station because these rare events happen rarely at any given place. That's why we call them rare events. Uh, just two counties south, Brazoria County has seen almost no trend, but the rainfall events they've had are larger. So the estimate of the one in a hundred event is up around 16 or 17 inches. Uh, if we look at how this changes from place to place, the estimate of the trend in extreme rainfall from individual stations is pretty large in Harris County and a few other parts of the state. And in most stations on the left-hand diagram, the dots are green, which means heavy rainfall is increasing uh, according to the historical record. But that's colored by those individual events. On the right, we see the effect of our local experience of that trend uh, caused by just the, uh, the rainfall events since the year 2015. Now Houston's had the Memorial Day flood, the Tax Day flood, Hurricane Harvey, Tropical Storm Imelda. Uh, they've experienced a lot of rain recently. So quite frankly, people living in Houston think extreme rainfall is increasing rapidly because their extreme rainfall has increased rapidly. Now, climate science says that climate change is driving an increased rainfall rate of about 15% over the 
over the past 60 years, which is a lot less than Houston's experienced. So, well, the good news for Houston is because of all those floods, uh, they're actually ahead of the curve in preparing for climate change. And uh, the true odds of a, the next really heavy rainfall event won't be um, uh, equal to their estimate, their biased estimate, for another few decades. Uh, they think the odds are too high than that, higher than they actually are. But what about a place like Dallas, where there's been almost no trend historically and nothing recently? Uh, they haven't experienced the extreme rainfall trend that scientists are telling them should be happening. So maybe that will make them more skeptical of the science. Uh, maybe, maybe they can think that it's increasing, but without feeling it, they really aren't prepared to take significant action. But the thing is, uh, since their odds have already gone up due to climate change, their perception of those odds are already too low. And so they think that this normal stuff is down here. The normal is now up here, and it's going to be even higher. So they're probably much less prepared for climate change just because they've been lucky to avoid uh, extreme rainfall recently. So three lessons to take from all this. First off, your normal is not my normal. It's not the normal of anybody else. It's a precious thing. We should value our past, value our past experiences, uh, much as uh, Dia said earlier today, to value our originality our, and our uniqueness. Uh, with respect to climate, your experience is not a reliable gauge of what normal climate is, especially when we're talking about changes of extreme rain or, all, or any extreme climate event that happens rarely. You actually do have to trust the scientists about what they're saying the trends are. And lastly, um, in all sorts of senses, your normal will never be normal again. Even if your past was perfectly normal, your future is your future. It's not going to be a replay of your past. And even if we take drastic action to reduce the magnitude of climate change, the climate is not going to go back to what it was before. And we're going to have to somehow or another deal with whatever that future climate is, just like you're going to have to deal with whatever the future brings to you, which I hope will be um, at least as precious as your past was to you. Thank you.